Welcome back to the Print on Demand cast. This week, we're answering your questions. That's right. We're giving you the keys to this episode in our latest mailbag segment. So let's get into it. If you're looking for a podcast that's fun, the Print on Demand cast is second to none. Grab a stand, Josiah, and keep it real. Fishing out advice with a comic appeal. The Print on Demand cast, it's the best. Welcome back, everybody, to the Print on Demand cast. It is great to have you all with us. And thanks again to uh, Suno.com for the incredible intro. Uh, it's our new house band that we have yet to actually give a name. But it was uh, very, very good. So welcome to the episode. Uh, with me, as always, is Travis Ross from Make Your Mark Design. And this week, Travis, as we mentioned, we're going to get into a mailbag segment. And we haven't done a mailbag episode in quite some time, but I think we we kind of have noticed an accumulation of some questions, whether it's in the Facebook group or Instagram DMs. And we thought, hey, let's answer these on air because maybe there are questions for people listening that might not be in our Facebook group, which is a mistake. You should be. I put on a mancast.com slash Facebook where you can go to join that group or maybe aren't on Instagram and obviously don't have access to RDMs and don't know what those conversations look like. So we thought, let's answer them in a public forum. So that's going to be this week's main event. But before we get there, uh, Travis, uh, we're coming off of Memorial Day weekend. I know you and your fam went to... Uh, Colorado Springs for the day. Mm -hmm. So how was the weekend? How was your Memorial Day? Uh, yeah. How, how, how was all of the festivities? Yeah, we didn't do a whole lot like festivities wise, but we did go down to yes. Colorado Springs. My daughter's down there in college at um, University, of Colorado, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. And she had to work uh, last night. So we oh, said, fun. we'll come to you. And so yeah. we Hung out down there, uh, hiked Mount Cutler, which we've done a bunch of times. It was always the, when we lived down there, it was always the little small mountain that we would always invite people to come hike if they were like from out of town, because yeah. it gives <laughs> so much like Colorado feels, yeah. but it's really easy. <laughs> so we've done it a ton, but it was fun with the kids, you know, every, every several years, you know, coming back there and they get to climb it again and uh, kind of relive some of their childhood because we did it so many times. Uh, nice. It was a nice afternoon. We um, dropped Trinity off at her work and then went out to eat and then drove home and, you know, got home like at eight o'clock. So it wasn't a late night. It wasn't sure. you know, too strenuous, but it was a lot of fun. What'd you do for Memorial Day? Yeah. So we, uh, what, what did I do? I had um, played some pickleball uh, in the morning mm -hmm. for a couple of hours and, uh, then uh, went over to Megan and, and Jason's house for uh, kind of a grill out. Josh and Carly joined us um, mm -hmm. and uh, Jason made some like homemade non bread um, mm. on the flat top grill. And then we had a bunch of meat and toppings. We kind of like made pita taco hybrids, I guess. Uh, cool. but they were delicious. So good. We're going to do it again for the fourth, but do like cheeseburger filling instead of like tacos and and. And give that a whirl. But yeah, it was, it was a good night. Um, like I said, Josh and Carly were with us. Uh, Will LaMonica, who actually has been on this show, oh, was with cool. us. Um, mm -hmm. So it was a good time. And uh, had, a, had a lot of fun. Got a lot of sun. Um, and just uh, enjoyed enjoyed the day. So uh, cool. yeah, overall, very good. So let's move things along. Again, we have a mailbag segment to get to with all the burning questions. But before we get to that, we are going to go to this week's weekly dad joke time for the weekly dad joke you know travis if sweet dreams are made of cheese then who am i to disagree <laughs> had to let that one sit it's a little like cheesy it. but uh ooh <laughs> a two for cheesy Another one, all for you guys. So yeah, feel free as always. Use that around your water coolers, and let us know. Or in Travis's case, poker night tomorrow night. 
uh, and uh, <laughs> let us know of the groans that you get when you uh, debut that joke to all of your friends. And we're going to keep things moving right along because this week, again, we have something that we wanted to highlight. This always doesn't happen in every episode, but uh, this is something that we've actually been sitting on for a while and finally now kind of plugged it into this episode to bring it to you for this week's Point of Interest. Well, howdy, partner. Welcome to the Point of Interest part of the POD cast. So grab your hat and hold on tight because we got some learning to do. All right, so Travis, let us know what is happening in the world of print on demand that uh, bears some attention. Yeah, it's not just the world of print on demand, but um, May second, it looks like um, there was a press release that said the following, and you may already have heard this, but uh, Shutterstock enters into definitive agreement to acquire Envato, um, which. Envato, if you don't know, has Envato Elements where you can download, you know, you can subscribe to it and then you can download all kinds of different things. It's, you know, almost like a Shutterstock in a way, but they also have um, audio clips and different things like that. But back probably four or five years ago, Envato actually acquired Placeit.net. Mm -hmm. So in all the time, yeah, Placeit, we talk I mean. about, yeah, we talk about Placeit all the time. It's great. Uh, mock-up generator for you um, to use in your print-on-demand listings. And so now it looks like Shutterstock is going to own um, Envato and by default place it because it looks like it's a whole big, um, you know, it's a big acquisition, $245 million um, that will be paid out at closing for wow. Envato. Which is, uh, you know, hey, that's that's a pretty good uh, Thursday or whenever, whatever day it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but there's a lot of cool things we can kind of go through. We'll we'll put this link in the uh, show notes. But let's let's bullet point a few facts about yeah. um, Shutterstock and Envato, Josiah. Yeah, let's look at this here. So um, some tr strategic highlights, I guess, when you look at, I guess, the merger or, or the buyout. I guess it's not maybe a merger. Um, but, um, it expands, it's going to expand Shutterstock's reach with a faster growing audience, like freelancers, mm -hmm. hobbyists, I guess it adds like 650,000 subscribers, which, which is, is crazy. That's doubling Shutterstock's subscriber base to about 1.15 million, which is mm -hmm. insane. And Shutterstock is going to have, uh, an increased content revenue from video, audio, graphics, fonts, templates. It's, it makes a ton of sense, I guess, from mm -hmm. a, from a business standpoint, um, to get this going. Uh, yeah. Travis, what else are we looking at in terms of, you know, some highlights of, of what's happening in this merger or buyout? Yeah, it looks, looks like here in Vado, um, when Envato adds or comes over to Shutterstock, it's going to increase Shutterstock by 10 million images, <laughs> 6 million videos, a million audio clips, a half million templates and, uh, 200,000 graphics and fonts, um, all from Envato. So it's going to not only increase their uh, image collection, but also like videos, like I said, audio clips, all of that other stuff. So they even have like PowerPoint slides, uh, keynote, WordPress uh, stuff, you know, like they have um, Theme Forest, I think is one of theirs. And mm -hmm. there's another one that they do WordPress templates. Um, and then of course, you know, uh, print on demand is another, you know, thing that Shutterstock's not necessarily a part of, but now with place it, they're going to have their hand in that. So yeah, the, I mean, there's a lot of other things that are, you know, happening as a result of this. We, unfortunately we don't know like when the day is going to be where the right. sale is going to take place. And we have no idea what it's going to do. It's probably ultimately going to increase fees because usually when things get acquired, fees go up, yep. <laughs> you know, sometimes they'll grandfather you in for maybe the rest of your subscription, but then when you reapply or what, you know, who knows what Shutterstock <laughs> is actually going to do yeah. if you are subscribed to place it or Envato elements or any of these other, you know, sub, uh, Envato subscription based services that they have, cause they have several. Um, so if you're subscribed to any of those, just, I guess, keep your ear to the ground and see yeah. what happens over the next weeks and months. Um, I would doubt anything's going to happen for the next 
year ish. Yeah, as it far looks as, like, like pricing, but I don't know. Yeah, it, it looks enough. like um, in the in the highlights here, an expected transaction closing in the third quarter, subject okay. to, to closing conditions. So we could be looking at Q three right before Q four, um, in, in making that kind of buyout complete, which will be interesting. We'll definitely keep you guys updated if we hear of anything or when it goes through. Maybe we can um, preview what the difference is, what it looks like, what we what now Shutterstock has to offer. Um, now, right. once that once that's completed, just in time for Q4 for you to use it <laughs> to to your heart's delight to, to market or make or make mockups or whatever it is that you're going to be able to do here. Um, but it's going to be, I think, it's going to be the functionality is going to be awesome. And uh, again, kudos to Shutterstock because that's a it's a brilliant move for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's really. Yeah, you're right. I think it's a really brilliant move. And for Envato, I mean, um, oh, yeah. in this little thing that we will send in the in the in the show notes, um, the link that it, it says uh, they began with humble beginnings in a Sydney, Australia garage, and since then, Envato has generated 1.3 billion in earnings. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, and like it's like we said earlier, 650 thousand subscribers. So. Yeah. Um, you know, that's going to be a good payday for them <laughs> for oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that's incredible. Um, yeah. yeah. So be sure to look at the show notes as well. And it will also be, uh, we'll also send it out in this week's newsletter um, that you can also sign up for print on a slash VIP. You can sign up to get that weekly newsletter and that will also mm -hmm. be in there. If you don't want to scroll through the show notes or whatever, just have it come directly to you. Um, you can do yep. that as well. So uh, we're going to move on to the main event. Uh, this week, uh, as we mentioned before, answering your questions, giving you guys the keys to the show and letting and kind of deciding the content that we talk about. So um, with that being said, let's go to this week's main event. You've got mail. Mailbag. Mailbag. I always feel um, the need to apologize for any PTSD that I gave any uh, boomers out there that used to use dial-up internet. <laughs> and hey, you know what us us Gen that. Xers did too, buddy. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's just like, mom, get off the phone. I'm trying to log on to AOL chat, and you're sitting there gossiping. That's right. I need to, I need to check my messages. Um, so, all right. So we're gonna we're gonna start right off the top with a message from a member of our Facebook group. And again, if you want to join that. Uh, print on a mancast.com slash Facebook is where you can go uh, if you want to send us questions as well or just kind of see the scuttlebutt um, that's happening and the uh, occasional dad joke that gets dropped in there. Um, so the first question is from Jessica. She says, this is my first go at print on demand and I have an Etsy shop that I opened April 1st with around 60 listings. The small town that my art, excuse me, that my antique slash artisan store is in has a few events that draw in thousands of people. I thought about setting up outside my shop with some of my print-on-demand items, but not sure on what sizes to stock up on and how many different styles. And we'll put mm -hmm. a small booth in my store as well with the event stock. I have done shows before for my antique store, but this is a whole other ball game with inventory. Any advice would be great. So sounds like she if I'm kind of gleaning correctly, she has a shop like an antique shop that she has hard goods. And, she, and Jessica sounds like she's venturing into POD uh, as an offshoot of that, maybe offering some of the stuff that she offers in her store on a print on demand basis. And she's wondering if she were to stock up for some events that are happening from her Etsy store, how should she yeah. go about that? Which is tricky. Cause I mean, it is, you know, the, 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 the pro of, of print on demand is you don't have to worry about stock and inventory. So Travis, if, mm -hmm. if this was you, what would you, what would you think? What, what advice would you give to somebody or that right. in this position? Yeah, I, um, uh, I guess a little caveat is that we have like in the Facebook group, I've already answered, uh, Jessica and had a little conversation or I guess, not really a conversation, but she responded to my response. And, um, and that's for all of these. We, you know, if you post something in the Facebook group, we're going to probably 
somebody's going to answer it. If it's not us, yeah. it's going to be somebody else. And, you know, you'll at least get some response. So, uh, so I asked Jessica immediately, like, do you have a heat press? Because I thought, well, if you have a heat press, that can really help because you can buy transfers for the designs yeah. that you want to do. And maybe you only do five designs, you know, but, um, and then you can choose which colors you want to do as far as, um, the blank shirts and, you can instead of ordering let's say you have six sizes um and you have five designs that's 30 um oh well i'm sorry no if you have five designs or oh gosh i'm doing math <laughs> live this isn't good um but if you do you know if you have like one or two colors and multiple sizes you have to do it and you buy them already printed you have to mm -hmm. do that many for each of the designs you want to do. However, if you still say, okay, I, I still only want to do two or three colors and you know, you're going to have all of those sizes. You only have to do that once. And it doesn't yeah. matter who buys what, because you're print pressing the actual design right there. Um, and I, I think that's, that's kind of the best possibility as far as like not having to order so much stock of your, of your t-shirts. But if that's not an option, um, I think, you know, the 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 answer she's probably looking for is, um, you know, which sizes sell the most. I'm going to say for for me and Josiah, I'd love to hear your um, your thoughts on this, too, because you did print on demand at a really high volume for that for that one particular client. Mm. And I know you probably have an idea of what would sell the most for us when we were doing this. It was mainly black shirts. And yep. I mean, we had other colors. Navy was a close second, sport gray or athletic gray, kind of that yeah. light. The um, heather kind of. Yeah, light thing. heather gray. That was a popular color, um, but black was by far the most. And I would say large and XL was probably number one and then probably large. Um, and then it could go either way with the 2XL or the medium. Um, if you were going to do like a small to 3XL, I would order the fewest smalls and the th fewest three XLs, yeah. mm -hmm. then probably mediums and two XLs at about the same pace and then stock up on larges and XLs. Um, what was your experience with like sizes and colors when you were doing all of yeah. that for that one client? Yeah, it's not too dissimilar from from your experience uh, when when he would order. I mean, he'd have some events that he was wanting some physical merch at. Uh, always went heavy on black shirts. The majority of his designs were all on black shirts because those sold the best. From a size perspective, it was the same. Large and extra large were always the most prevalent. Um, and 2X would seem to outweigh medium a little bit. But to your point, mm -hmm. same kind of kind of a toss up. Um, and so when he would put in orders originally, he would, he would go really heavy on the smalls and mediums and less on the large and extra large. And then he would sell out of the large and extra large and then right. have a bunch of small and mediums to take with him to the next stop. So we were always for a while supplementing the large and extra large, um, sizes until mm -hmm. we kind of re-strategized on, Hey, maybe we lean harder this time in your new order. Um, on large and extra large. The other thing about that too that I encouraged him to do, which he ended up doing at a certain point, was because it was all also available on print on demand, having something available, a sign or even a laptop there at the table where if someone walks up and wants a shirt in a small or a medium and you're sold out, for them to just order it directly from the site that you're selling it on a print on demand version, have it shipped to them <clears throat> is also really nice. Um, because they can still get the same shirt. They, they might not walk away from the event, but if they really want the shirt and and want it in that size, you can offer to send it to them um, and have them order it and give them a code for free shipping or something like that since it was a result of you being sold out in person. But that's another way that we that a lot of our clients would also supplement too to help with the, the sizing issue if they sold out of one size before another. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. Um, and then an episode... Uh, 86 we actually talked about how to prep for summer markets um because mm -hmm. that's something that make your mark design did for what two years in a row right was it mm -hmm. two yeah. yeah and so i mean i was a part of a lot of those conversations of when it came to shirts and hoodie sizes like what do we what sizes what colors what design yeah. do we do we want to sell and so there's some more strategy uh that goes <laughs> we deep dive into that in episode 86 
So um, that might be uh, of use to you as well. If you're someone like Jessica in the same boat, trying to kind of plan what you're going to take with you to a, to a, a booth or event or market or something like that. Yeah. And I, I think if we would have kept doing it, we would have eventually tried to do like the flat press with um, specific designs tatered to the event that we were doing. Like, um, yeah. you know, if we were going to do a swim meet, we'd have swimming type of things, or if we were going right. to do this, you know, and then we, you could also potentially, if, um, if, if you really get crazy, you could do some vinyl, you could bring a vinyl printer and like do names, um, on, on the back of whatever and kind of customize them. Yeah. Um, we, we specifically focused on hats and we had, uh, leatherette that we had laser engraved so it had designs on it and then yeah. it had an adhesive on the back and people would choose their hat and they would choose their patch and then we had a heat press and we would right there in front of them um put the patch on you know the on the hat and so they'd walk away with a custom yeah. hat so we also had a lot of other products but those were you know to your point more static products products that are had already been printed and we didn't really have a way to uh do anything except for bring those whatever size right. they were and if they and we had a lot of leftovers you know there were a lot of things yeah. that didn't sell and um maybe we maybe if i had it to do again we might focus on less products and uh really kind of highlight the ones that um, you know, maybe just a few that were static, but really try to right. push the custom ones for the all yeah. the reasons that we've just you know talked about here. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say is is maybe uh, the approach of highlighting the experience of creating a custom product as opposed to maybe pushing some of the static ones that you already have available mm -hmm. on your store. So maybe you're offering something if you have a heat press or the ability to do things custom on site, uh, people mm -hmm. are more prone to engage or more excited maybe to engage in the process of creating something that's unique and, and one of one um, instead yeah. of maybe buying something that they can also find on Etsy. So maybe your product offering is in the same niche and in the same style, but maybe different from what's on your store. And so you're not worried about selling the static stuff. You're, you're just creating custom um, apparel. That was a, a, a pitch that I gave to a, a pretty prominent podcaster in the pro wrestling space was mm -hmm. printing shirts at these shows they were doing and oh, allowing people awesome. that experience. Um, I never heard back. And then I went to one of those shows and saw them doing it in the lobby. So they, I mean, whether, <laughs> whether it was my <laughs> advice that they took, if it was me or if they'd already had the idea, it's hard to say in my world, I I'd like to take credit, but you know, who doesn't want to take credit for a good idea? Um, but it probably wasn't me. Uh, so, all right, moving on to the next question. Uh, this comes from Instagram or Instagram DMs, Dishorted Vintage, which I, or Dishorted. Dishorted sounds like a medical problem, but Dishorted <laughs> <laughs> Vintage, yeah, I think is a little better. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, if I'm not, you can slide back in our DMs and give us a phonetic spelling. Uh, it says, Hi. I uh, appreciate all the info you've been posting. If you don't mind, is there a DTF or direct-to-film printer you would recommend at the top of your list? We have a five-color manual press, but still deciding if we want to make the leap to DTF. The majority of our business is upcycling vintage clothing, but we've recently started to wholesale to boutiques. So, Travis, mm -hmm. what would you say if you had to... I mean, first of all, I don't know that there's a lot of stateside DTF printers to make a top five list from. <laughs> but right. if, you had, if yeah. you had to pick, you know, one that you've heard the, you know, good reviews, I know there's lots that are just coming out, but mm -hmm. if you had to pick one at the top of your list, what is it and why? Why? Uh, so I think there's a couple of ways you can answer, go about answering this. And I, again, I had answered him uh, in, in the DMS and uh, what I suggested to him um, was a, a DTG DTF combo. Um, if you're not going to do a ton of things, because that gives you more opportunity, you can also do DTG if you want to, you know, so you could get a pre trader and you could do some DTG things. Um, but you could also do DTF on those. And so we, we highlighted the, um, the F 2270 and the F 1070 recently, which are Epson's newest kind of, and they call them hybrid, uh, printers because they can do both. 
However, if you have an old 2100, um, you can do DTF. We've done DTF with the 2100 and our 3070s. Um, pretty much any DTG printer can do um, can do DTF, even if you have to stop it in the middle and rerun it. You know, so uh, you know if you don't have the ability to tell it to lay the the color first and then the white over it in a mirrored way on on the on the film, you can still kind of get around that by doing a color only mirrored print and then do a, a regular DTG print mirrored. And as soon as it lays the white, you would stop it and cancel the job. Um, so it wouldn't come back and do the color over the white because remember it's backwards. So right. that's one way you could do it is just with a regular DTG machine, but anymore um, there are some, some companies out there now, you know, I was just, at the Atlantic city, um, show for, uh, what's it called again? Um, gosh, impressions expo impressions. Yeah. And yeah. And so, um, and I, and back at, in California, we were there and we were talking a lot to the Cobra flex guys who have some really nice machines. And, um, so I, I would, I would rec recommend a Cobra flex machine or, um, in Atlantic City, I was hanging out a lot with the owner of Omni uh, OmniPrint, and they have really transitioned from DTG to DTF and have several um, several machines that they're making now that are really great. And they have some kind of uh, OmniPrint has a really cool um, ink and film combo that they're actually selling now you can get it from them directly that yeah. is like when you peel it it's a hot peel and when you peel it it's like butter i actually did a project <laughs> for a company here um in colorado for like a local um a local project local company asked me to pr provide them some shirts and i ordered from um uh, from OmniPrint because I had seen what they could do previously. Um, nice. And it's not super expensive and it's absolutely amazing quality colors are popping. And then man, it's just, it's literally like butter when you peel that, that uh, top sheet off yeah. of the, the print. Yeah. It's gorgeous. So yeah. those would be my two pure DTF machines and you can get, different sizes with shakers with rollers um you know all of that uh from either cobra flex or omniprint nice so there you go there is the top two recommendations from from travis and i will agree that there's nothing better than a nice hot peel uh when it comes mm -hmm. to transfers cold peels uh not, not so always much. not a fan uh i remember i don't know what job we were doing um when i was working there at make your mark design but the transfer we accidentally ordered a cold peel so we had to like do it and then have a, like a dryer to like try and speed up the process to cool it enough to peel and it was dumb so hot peel for the win in my opinion so <laughs> moving on to the next question uh susan uh, also from the facebook group says so i have two questions so what we'll do is we'll answer read the first one answer the first one read the second one answer the second one uh, and cool. say it, all for the purpose of trying to to keep this uh, organized for you, the listener, and not getting lost um, in uh, in both questions. So, uh, first question: What is everyone using to help with pricing? I feel like Etsy is a race to the bottom and not helpful helpful for me in a Shopify store. I am working on pricing T-shirts right now, and they have the option to put names and a number on the back through Gelato's personalization platform. So. I guess the core of the question is, is there anything that we can use to help pricing? Um, I don't know if she's asking if there's like a tool that can help uh, check prices. And because I, I correct me if I'm wrong, we'll leave Amazon. There's something like that that can check like the lowest buy box make price. And then how much the... you make. And yeah. Right. Like all, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I feel like Etsy's a race to the bottom and not helpful for working in a Shopify store. So she's working on, pr on pricing teasers, Travis. So I guess with not a whole lot of context to that first mm -hmm. question, what is a strategy you would give in pricing on Etsy? Is it a race to the bottom? Um, I know that that became the 
the idea behind Amazon after a certain number of time, a certain amount of time, it was like, yeah, it is just a race mm -hmm. to the bottom. Is Etsy the right. same way? What are some pricing strategies that, and advice that you would give to Susan um, as she's pricing her t-shirts? Well, it looks like, or it sounds like from her question, she says she feels like Etsy's a race to the bottom and not helpful for me working in a, in Shopify, a Shopify store. store. So it sounds like she's doing Shopify, which um, right off the bat gives you uh, kind of a boost on your your actual profits after the sale because you're not paying Etsy's commission or Amazon's commission or Walmart's commission or whoever. Right. Um, right. You're getting the everything you know you're getting the full purchase price and then you just have to pay your supplier and of course pay for advertising and uh, you know the rest is going to be your net your net profit so i would say also it, it sounds like you're doing um custom products or personalized yeah. products which in my opinion and i think it's it goes without saying you can charge a lot more when people are able to personalize their uh, their gifts. And so, um, I am, I feel like because you're on a Shopify store, um, you should be able to charge pretty much whatever you want because people yeah. can't, if once they're there at your store, there's not other sellers that they can compare prices with. <laughs> it's like what you have, either they feel it's a good value for the designs that they're seeing and the ability to personalize and the different you know, things that you have provided for them on the Shopify, they have a, a no like and trust factor for you potentially, right. or they don't, you know, if they feel like, oh, these are too expensive, they're not going to buy. So I, I feel like there's a tension there for sure at the same time. Um, so if you are looking at uh, pricing, um, just in general with brick and mortar retailers, they do a thing called keystone pricing. And so what that means is if they buy it from their wholesaler at, you know, $15, they put it in their store for $30 and it's basically two X, you know, and they're getting all of their profit and paying all of their expenses from that, um, from that half you know, half of the total sale, which is what Keystone is. So basically you take what you bought it for and you double it. That can work in print on demand. Um, it can also, it can also uh, cause you to really sell low too, because for instance, I mean, I can get a coffee mug for, you know, $8 shipped to my client but I'm not going to pay. I'm not going to just charge $16 because I can get 20, right? <laughs> you know? So, uh, at the same time, maybe you have, uh, an expensive supplier like, like Printful maybe, and, and, uh, their shirt, their Bella after shipping and everything, um, you know, is like $18. And so do you really want to charge 36? You can, if your design's good enough. Right. And then the other consideration that you have to make is, are you going to, is shipping part of the product cost in your mind and in your books? Is it part of the product cost or is it uh, something that you, uh, that comes out of your profit? So for instance, let's say your shirt costs $12 and it costs $5 to get it there. That's $17. Right. Your technically your keystone would be $24. Um, and so are you charging that? Or are you going to take that extra $5 and put it as part of your keystone? So now you're up at 34, 17 times two is 34. Um, you have to make that decision. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with saying you're uh, going to meet in the middle on those two and maybe put right. part of your shipping as, you know, as your product cost. But um, I think from an accounting standpoint, it makes, it makes the most sense to, um, you know, build, bake in as many costs as you can because come bacon. tax time you can <laughs> yeah, bacon i said bacon uh because come tax time you can deduct all that stuff but it, i don't yeah. know that it really matters if it's in your cogs or if it's after your cogs and coming out of your gross profit it doesn't really necessarily matter because it's all going somewhere else and you're going to report that and only pay tax on your net earnings at the end of the day um i know i've said a whole lot of things and i haven't really answered the question <laughs> Uh, but, um, I think somewhere between a keystone and maybe a little less, um, based on your competition is probably a safe place to, 
especially because you're doing personalized products and people will always pay more if they can personalize their off or your offerings. It's just, you right. see it all over the place. Now there are people that are racing to bottom, bottom, even with personalization, but you're not them. You want to actually make a right. profit and you want to actually um, make some money on this, this, in this print on demand business. So um, don't, don't race to the bottom um, but don't, you know, you don't have to be at the top of, you know, of the, you don't have to charge what Supreme charges, you know, or, or some of those right. really high end clothing companies. Um, you know, it's also going to depend. I know I keep talking, I'm sorry. And it also depends on like what blank you're using. Are you using a Bella? Or are you using a, you know, a Gildan 5,000 that, you know, is really stiff and it feels cheap and, you know, people may not, may or may not like right. that. So there's a lot of factors that go into it. And, um, but I will say at the end of the day, you don't have to necessarily price exactly what your cheapest competitor is pricing at. Don't fall into that trap. That is the race to the bottom in, in and of itself. So don't right. be the cheapest. Don't be the most expensive. Make a nice, healthy margin for yourself. That's what I'll say about yeah. that. <laughs> Succinct. Um, so <clears throat> the second question, second part of her question, which gives a probably a little bit more um, clarity or maybe some context. She says, speaking of, and she's referencing uh, Gelato's personalization platform. These are football shirts. The personalization is supposed to let people put their own names on the shirts and pick a number. Is there a liability issue if people are putting players' names and numbers on the back? Because the personalization is automated, I wouldn't be able to catch this before they get printed unless I make them all manual orders. Hmm. Hmm. Well, <laughs> I think it kind of depends, really. You know, when yeah. you say they're football shirts, I mean, um, do you have the Kansas City Chiefs logo on it? Because then you have an issue regardless what name they put on it. Right. <laughs> you know, um, if you're using actual teams and their logos on the shirts, then, yeah. mm -hmm. then yes, absolutely. If if it's, you know, more of a, a tip of the hat to that particular, you know, city or fan base, um, then uh, again, I, I, I think you can have plausible deniability that you allowed people to put whatever they wanted and this customer decided to put, you know, Kelsey or Mahomes or, you know, Swift right, right. <laughs> uh, on that shirt. Um, and so that... it. I, I think you might be able to get out of it. And the other thing is, is that you're probably not worth the time for like the NFL, for instance, to yeah. come after you. Mm -hmm. um, and unless you really, really, really were blowing up and got, yeah. you know, some traction behind you. So you're probably safe at the same time. Um, it is kind of a gray area and, you know, I could probably go either way. Uh, on this one, what say you, Josiah? Yeah, again, I think we've talked a lot about um, these like vague gray areas when it comes to copyright and what is and is not permissible or allowed or a good idea. Um, Travis's point, you know, if you are burying the lead and you didn't say that you also have, you know, the Denver Nuggets logo on the front, I know it's a football shirt, but, you know, same thing goes if it's a Broncos logo on the front. First of all, mm -hmm. why? Second of all, that's <laughs> going to be the main problem <laughs> is if there's a Broncos actual logo. Now, Travis, you mentioned a tip of the cap, and you know, you're a lot some of your projects that you've done in the past that use and pull and kind of tip the cap to some professional mm -hmm. football players and incorporate some color schemes. That is different, I think. Um, mm -hmm. and to your point. If there is an issue with using players' last names, you would have to make a lot of sales for anyone to care. And I always used to think of it, uh, right or wrong, um, for me, is if I were to get a cease and desist from said entity, that mm -hmm. means that I probably made enough noise slash money to be like, you're right, I'm done. <laughs> you just kind of walk <laughs> away and count your money, you know, all the way home. So, but... <clears throat> It can be a little tricky, especially if you're giving people the ability to put what they want on the shirt. Can, right. Are they uploading names and numbers only? Is there images they can upload? Because then that's dangerous because then they don't care about your shop and if it gets shut down for, mm -hmm. for you know, infringement or copyright infringement or anything like that. 
So it is one of those gray areas where if it's just nam na last names and numbers, you could be okay. If there's anything yeah. of actual intellectual property that's being incorporated on the shirt itself, I would encourage you to stop and kind of rethink what the design and, and what you're offering just to protect yourself in the long yeah. run. So. And I want to say one other thing. I, I think what we've been talking about is specifically for Shopify. If you were, if you're selling on yeah. Etsy, I, I think, um, or, or Amazon or any of the other platforms, if it's not your own platform, don't do this. Um, don't do this on Etsy because they are going to be a lot more, uh, finicky <laughs> if you will it, there's just a lot more eyes potentially on it and so um you you know there's just a lot more potential for bad things to happen on those platforms than say a uh you know say a shopify site that you know you're just advertising yeah. on instagram and facebook it's it's a different yeah kind of a, a different level of risk, I think. And you don't want your entire shop, your entire Etsy store to get shut down because somebody decided to put Mahomes on the back. And that particular day, uh, Mahomes legal team was on Etsy and saw it or something, you know what I mean? So um, for channels, I think there's a higher level of risk than if it's your own store. So just wanted to put that caveat before we move on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> Completely agree. Etsy, take it from personal experience uh, from my wife. Uh, don't put that kind of stuff on Etsy because it don't matter <laughs> if you're just a tip of the cap or not. They're not fans. Okay, so last question uh, in this week's mailbag segment comes from Matthew, uh, who's also part of the Facebook group over there at printondemandcast.com slash Facebook. He says, do I need a separate Shopify store for each niche? Or can I build out a site that has multiple niches or is that the plural niches, niches sure. as collections okay. niches. <laughs> <laughs> or do I direct people to a collection instead of my homepage? So I guess this is one of those things where it's like, I don't know that there's necessarily a, a wrong answer. Um, Maybe mm -hmm. kind of the all things are permissible, not all things are beneficial category <laughs> of uh, of design here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, um, I don't know. I I'm of the opinion that I mean, when you look at the novelty site shirt sites out there, you do have the idea that there are collections and sub niches that they break it down into, whether it's gaming, movies, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you're just doing uh, kind of a catch-all novelty t-shirt site for your, that's your business. Um, and you want to have categories that people can f delve further into like niches. I've seen that done. Um, mm -hmm. if you are, I think if you are going for a specific niche, um, let's say, you know, hunting and, and fishing is, is your thing and you're, you're creating shirts around that whole subculture. I don't know necessarily that it would make sense to also have a pickleball section if you right. also have pickleball yeah. interests. I think that gets confusing in, in the end user. Um, and I, 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 the more you do that, I don't know that necessarily you'll have luck dialing in. Um, well, let me say this. If you do that, you might as well just do a novelty t-shirt site and mm -hmm. not say that you're a focused niched um, line of, of anything um, and just kind of call a spade a spade and that's what you're doing. Um, if you're not right. going to be specific to a, uh, to a particular niche and audience, um, yeah. then you might as well be uh, a novelty shirt site, which presents a whole different category or a whole different um, set of challenges when you're trying to then break through the noise of all right. of the other dozens and dozens of, of novelty t-shirt sites. I've told this story before um, that, you know, my father-in-law towards the end of, of what for apparel wanted to start a novelty t-shirt site just because we had assets that were collecting, you know, digital dust and we weren't really using all of them. So his thought was just to put them on a novelty t-shirt site. And my biggest pushback was like, why? Like what's, what makes this any different from the third, like the amount of ad spend you're going to have to do in Google, Facebook, Instagram to break through the noise, to bring people in, 
Like mm -hmm. you're, it's going to get way too confusing. And so that's, that's my put, that's my only right. caution. It's, it takes a lot to break through the noise. If you're just going to be another super or, uh, um, shirt store, that's selling novelty tees, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to picking a niche and targeting that particular subset of audience to come right. to your site it might be a little bit easier. And yeah. yes, it might look like you have multiple, um, Shopify stores dedicated to each niche. If that's what you're wanting to do is keep them separate or put it all mm -hmm. in the same pot and see what happens. Yeah. My, my thought on this whole thing is, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about it with kind of, you know, somebody who's got, uh, and you just said it too, like they have a fishing, hunting, whatever. And then all of a sudden they have a crypto you know, something happens in the crypto world and they want to hop on the trend and they just put a crypto shirt up. It's like on a hunting shirt. You know what? That doesn't make any sense. Um, or, or they're trying to trend trend set, you know, or not trend set, but like trend follow and, and putting things up for different trends. Um, I don't think that's the best strategy with Facebook anyway, because it just makes your marketing so difficult. If you're going to do Facebook, uh, or, or I'm, I'm sorry, if you're going to do Shopify, you're going to probably do, be doing uh, Instagram and Facebook ads. And the beauty about those ads is that Facebook and Instagram learn over time who your target customer is. But if you're changing your target customer all the time, it's Facebook's not going to figure that out, you know? And so, and then, then you're trying to collect emails so you can remarket to them for free, but who knows what they bought? I mean, there's so many different products and different niches. It's not the same type of person. So your marketing is going to be much less effective when you do that. The other thing I'll say towards towards the end, you said, do I direct people to a collection instead of my homepage? And I would say, don't direct people to a collection or your homepage. Direct, if you're going to advertise on Facebook, direct them to a product page, always. Always direct to a product page. If they want to explore and look at the other yeah. products that you have on your site, that's fine. You want to make the least amount of friction for that sale to happen. So right. the best way to do that is put them on a page that you have just advertised to them and that's why they clicked. Don't make them go find that product again because they won't do right. it. They'll bounce and they're gone and you won't, you'll lose the sale. But if they're right there, they can choose their color and their size and add to cart. Um, you have a much better opportunity to get the sale. Um, so yes, I would say to exactly what you said, Josiah, niche your Shopify store down and you can do collections, but make sure that all of the people that would come to your store are the same type of people. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's a guy who just hunts and there's a guy who just fishes, but there's a lot more of them that do both most likely, you know? And so those can be different collections, but they're generally the same type of person that's that may be interested in what you have to offer on your Shopify store. Don't go starting, you know, don't do wrestling teas and crypto teas and cat teas and all this other stuff, because it's just going to, A, it's going to cost you a lot more to market to them. Um, and B, your marketing is going to be a lot less effective. I guess that's A yeah. and B kind of wrapped up in one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, uh, that wraps up the mailbag segment. It has been fun to answer questions and to, you know, like I said, give you guys the keys to kind of determine, you know, what we talk about on the show. So we can do this again. And it's really predicated on your guys' interaction with us on Instagram, Facebook, responding mm -hmm. to the VIP emails that uh, you can subscribe to at penandamancast.com slash VIP. Um, but we would love to do more of these episodes and uh, and answer your questions more for lack of a better term, in real time. But uh, for now, uh, we're going to wrap this up. Thank you guys so much for listening. Again, if you want to stay in the know uh, and get an additional dose of print-on-demand cast knowledge, uh, again, printondemandcast.com slash VIP is where you can go to sign up for the weekly newsletter. We will not harass you. We will not spam you. We will not uh, bother you or ask for your social security. It's not a scam. Basically what I'm saying. We're not going to spam you or scam you. It's just additional information. And in exchange for your email, we will give you an annual design calendar. Uh, spoiler alert, folks. Uh, Q4 is just around the corner. Okay. Uh, we, we're in Q2 right now. Q3 is coming. Uh, and Q4 will be here before you know it. And so the design calendar helps you stay abreast of all of the things you should be designing for, planning for, selling for, marketing for, uh, and is a great tool to use. And if you've 
given us your email and you have yet to receive your annual design calendar, you can respond to one of those emails and say, hey, what's good? Uh, give me my calendar. <laughs> you can uh, reach out to us on Facebook or on Instagram, uh, but just say, hey, I signed up and I didn't receive my calendar. Send us your email and we can rectify that mistake as soon as possible. So uh, Travis, anything else before we wrap this one completely up and uh, put a bow on it? Uh, I don't think so. Just appreciate you guys asking questions in the Facebook group and, you know, on, in all of the places and keep doing it. We'll keep trying to give you the best advice that we can. Yes, absolutely. So for next, till next time, rather for Travis, I'm Josiah. We'll see you right here on the print on demand cast. See ya. Hey, babe. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Print On Demand cast. We hope you enjoyed the Totally Tubular show. If you've got a question or a suggestion for the show, send Travis and Josiah an email at info at printondemandcast.com. Want to be wicked nice? Take a minute to rate and review the show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe now so you don't miss next week's episode. See you next time for sure.